<clears throat> delighted again once to uh, again to be with you tonight and to study the most important things that we can study together, the Word of God. And I appreciate the way that you have listened so far in this series of lessons, and I appreciate the many uh, kind words, and thank you for that, the encouragement. Thank you for the hospitality both yesterday and the Coxes tonight had us over. We thank you. Thank you for that. And we're thankful for all the visitors from various places who've come to express your faith in the gospel of Christ. You are showing that you believe the word of God is still powerful in your life and deserves to be honored and glorified. And I thank you for that. I appreciate each one that's represented here because you believe in Jesus Christ. What we're trying to do in this series of lessons is analyze our own approach and our own faith in Jesus, whether we believe in the right one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was concerned about brethren in the first century, so surely he would also be concerned about brethren now, and rightly so. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and this is the springboard upon which we are analyzing various ways in which our minds might be corrupted. He says, I'm, I'm afraid, I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Corrupted minds from the simplicity that is in Christ. In other words, there's a, a right way to believe in Jesus, a right way to approach Jesus, and then there are corrupt ways. And we've got to make sure that our minds haven't been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. We looked at a way last night that that could be possible. We looked at the various ways that the apostles thought that Jesus was absolutely wonderful. And then we analyzed, but what about us? Or do we think that Jesus is absolutely wonderful? And is it, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened and will ever happen to us is Jesus Christ and what he provides us in his precious body? Or has our minds kind of been corrupted so that we've kind of choked out Jesus and it's all about the world, the here and now, all the political things and all the immorality that we're stressed about and all of that, and our minds is not so elated about how wonderful Jesus is as our minds been corrupted. So that was the thought last night. Now he goes on in verse uh, four to say, if somebody comes and preaches another Jesus, so just because his name that you're calling is Jesus doesn't mean that you have been captured by the right Jesus and are captivated by him. Maybe another Jesus, maybe it's one that we have adjusted Maybe we've added some imagination to revelation. Instead of it all being revelation, guiding our thoughts about Jesus, the right one, maybe we've mixed a little revelation and a lot of imagination, maybe a lot of desire. And we've made up a Jesus that fits more like, you know, this is, he's adjusted to my style. He fits me better. So he's saying you can preach, an, somebody can come along and preach another Jesus than the apostles preached. So that's the standard. Is that what the apostles preached? And if it's not, then we need to get away from that Jesus. And so he's saying here, somebody comes along and preaches another Jesus that we've not preached. He said, you, you may well put up with it. And he's not complimenting them for that. He's just saying, you're willing to put up with things you ought not to put up with. And verse 20, he says, you put up with it when one brings you into bondage. If one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, 
If one strikes you on the face, you put up with things you ought not to put up with. And sometimes we put up with things because we thought of it. You know, I wanted Jesus to be like this. And so I've molded my Jesus to be a certain way. And so we've got to examine whether that's happened, whether our minds have been corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And if that has happened, we've got to get back to pushing out imagination and making it all revelation. This is handling the word of God and not handling, handling it deceitfully. All right. So tonight I thought, well, listen, if we're looking at various ways that we can be uh, involved in a different Jesus than the one that the apostles preached. What about this? Is the Jesus that we think we believe in and that we claim that we love him, is that the Jesus that just goes along with us? Or does he challenge us every step of the way? In other words, he doesn't let us just stay the same. You hear so many people talk about, when you come to our church, just come as you are. Our Jesus will accept you just as you are. And you hear that kind of expression over and over in today's society. I scratch my... Jesus never accepted us as we are. I mean, he wants us to come to him, all you that labor and are heavy laden and... He will give you rest, but there are conditions and there is a transformation that he expects to happen in us. And if that change is not taking place, then he's not happy. He's not pleased with that. The most challenging Jesus is what I see in the New Testament. He challenging, challenges us to not stay the same. And therefore to become transformed, not conformed to the world, but transformed. I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, just a moment here. Because I want us to look at the real Jesus. Now this is not a popular version of Jesus. But look at Matthew chapter 19. And here is the Jesus that the apostles presented and they didn't they didn't i mean if, if they were just interested in formulating a jesus that pleased them then they really missed the boat right here in matthew chapter 19 because here is a jesus that really surprised even the apostles i mean it, matthew writes it down this way mark records it as well but they record that Jesus was tested on the issue of whether it's lawful to divorce your wife for any reason. And the popular theory was, of course, if you don't like this one, then give her a certificate of divorce and then away with that and get you one that, you, that fits you better. And that was the mentality. And that's the mentality now. And even the apostles, when he when he he said what he said on this, they was, they said, "Wow! I mean, if that's the case, if you're what you're saying, Jesus, so verse ten, he says, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. I mean, your rules, Jesus, is not very easy to comply with. And just think about that." If they're making up this Jesus, then they're not going to write about this Jesus. So they're not making him up. They're telling what the real Jesus was about and what he said, whether it's popular or not. And whether people want to go along with it or not, it's still the right Jesus. And he challenges us. He challenges us on the, on the issue of, of whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart or whether he's kind of way down. My lusts and my desires and all about me, the things that I want, that's, that's way up here. It all revolves around me. And when you give me a, you give me this, this law about 
no easy divorce. The apostles weren't quite ready for that. And they said, wow, I mean, it's better for us not to, because that's going to require a really strong commitment. And Jesus challenges them and us. And you get to, you got to look deep within yourself because he's not going to let you say, well, you know, you, I mean, you're going to have to accept me, Jesus, as I am and whatever I want, that's got to be priority. I'll take a little bit of it, but I, I, you're all, you're not in my, the picture on this deal. You're out of the picture on this deal. And he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. Now, he's not saying that's okay. He's just saying, here's the real picture here, that some people can accept it because they love me above everything else. And some people can't. They just don't have it. They don't have the love for me. Their priorities are mixed up. They don't think I'm good enough. They don't think I'm worth it. So after stating that, after stating that, and he says it's given to those, it's, it's for those who, who have the right things in place to start with. The right love, the right commitment. You got those things in place, then you are the kind of person that can do what I just said. You can handle what I just said. And he says, you know, and that's not that big a difference. I mean, when you look at this, verse 12, he says, there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and they handle things. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. So they lived that single life. And there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. So they think the kingdom of heaven is worth it. And so they say, well, because I wasn't, I didn't scripturally divorce. And if I marry again, then Jesus makes it very clear that I'm going to be committing adultery and I want to go to heaven more than I want to commit adultery. And so then you're, they are tested on the issue of whether or not they love the Lord, their God with all of their heart. So some preach a different Jesus when it comes to issues like that. I, I don't want that Jesus. And so they preach a difference in a uh, different one that's a little easier on that topic on marriage and divorce and remarriage. And so Jesus wasn't going to hesitate to say, here's the truth right here. And if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is great enough. And if Jesus is good enough to you, then you can make that kind of commitment. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So the apostles, you know, they were just not preaching. I mean, once they grasped that, they didn't, they understood they had to preach Jesus. And so Matthew wrote it down. I wonder if there was some hesitancy. I know the spirit was guiding him as he was writing these things down. But I wonder if in the back of his mind, he was, I don't want to write this. But he knew it was the truth and the spirit was guiding him. And he wrote it down and this was the real Jesus. He wasn't the one that is pushed today. The Jesus today doesn't demand change doesn't demand it at all you do what you want to do and he's going to love you just as you are and he's going to and somehow they've kind of translated him loving me as accepting me 
And that's, those are not two different concepts altogether. He does love the sinner. He loved me at my worst, Romans chapter 5 says. He loved me when I was yet a sinner. And he loved me to the death. But did he accept me as I was? Well, no, he says he gave you access because he loves you and he wants you. He gave you access by his grace, but you've got to take it. The Jesus of today doesn't demand much change at all, but listen to this. I'm dropping down in this same chapter after he had discussed this topic of divorce and remarriage. Drop down to verse 16. And it says here, now, behold, one came and said to him, good teacher. Now, hone in on that. He says, you're a good teacher. Good teacher. What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus, it looks like to me, verse 17, he says, so he said, so he said to him, why do you call me good? As if, if the real Jesus is looking into his heart and he's looking into our heart, do you really think that I am good? You really think I'm good? And you need to, because Jesus is absolutely good. He's absolutely wonderful. But do you really think that? And so this young man that called him good teacher, he's just, He's just opened himself up for Jesus to look right into his heart and said, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. And of course, Jesus knows he's God. But he's analyzing this man's heart. Do you think I'm God? And if you think I'm God, do you think I'm absolutely good so that when I tell you what you need to do, you're going to do it? Or will it be the case that we'll find right quick that you don't think I'm good enough at all? So why do you, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. But if you want to enter into life, Keep the commandments. Now, this young man, the Lord really liked a lot about him. The young man said, which ones? And Jesus said, well, and I want you to notice here that he goes spent through the Ten Commandments, but he skips one, skips several, but I want you to notice the one that he skipped. He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. I, I can envision this young man said, oh, I got it made then. Yeah, I hadn't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. You not bear false witness and honor your father and your mother. And, you, and then he's kind of skipped out of the Ten Commandments and he went to the, the greatest of all. He says, you shall love your neighbor, or the second greatest of all, Leviticus 19. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, well, all of these I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And I find it interesting that Jesus honed in on this man's covetousness. That's the one he skipped. And I think intentionally so. Because he knew this man had a problem with covetousness. Materialism. It was all about the comforts that he had. And, and the things that he possessed. And he, he liked the idea of having God in his life as well. And, and living a clean, decent, moral life. But he didn't really check up on his own heart when it came to the issue of whether he was covetous or materialistic. And his mind was devoted to material things instead of spiritual and eternal things. 
So Jesus has honed in on something here, intentionally so. And it's not like Jesus has made this commandment that if you're going to follow me, you can't possess anything. That wasn't his point. Possessing things is different than things possessing you. Do you know the difference? This young man had things possessing him, controlling his heart, controlling his value system. What's the most important thing to you? Is Jesus wonderful? How wonderful is he? Is Jesus good? How good is he to you? Is he better than your things? Is he better to you than your house, your car, your bank account? Is he better to you than your children, your wife, your husband? Yes, your own life also? You see, Jesus of today really doesn't have a lot to say about such deep heart issues. He doesn't have a lot to say to challenge you to the core, to make you look at yourself and look deeply and look honestly and tremble that I've let my mind become corrupted. I let my mind become corrupted. I've got another Jesus. I don't have the right one anymore. And he went on to say, assuredly, I say to you. Now, that young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. So Jesus turns out, turns out Jesus really wasn't good to him, at least not good enough for that. And when he heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And he traded the real Jesus off and said, I don't want the real one. And then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you, that's, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say impossible, but it's hard because sometimes material things blind people. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, you know, they heard that other expression on marriage and divorce. And wow, Jesus is challenging us right to the core. And they were exceedingly amazed, it said, and well, and who can be saved? It looks like. Nobody can be saved. Jesus looked at to them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. In other words, God has a way of making things so that, yes, it's possible for every one of us. And it was even possible for that young man. But he had to get his value system in the right place. Peter answered and said to him, See, we've left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? And so Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And that happened. The day of Pentecost, Jesus has, is seated on the throne of his glory, and the apostles now are seated on their thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 3,000 of them heard the judgments that came down through the apostles, and they repented, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in Acts 2. So, all of that to say this, that it was made possible for everybody on the day of Pentecost to be saved. And God made a way for them 
and 3,000 repented and were baptized into Christ. And God made the way for them. All right, so let's look at some things. The different Jesus accepts only the changes that you want to make today, but that's a different Jesus. The one that we read in the Bible says, here's the standard. You've got to reach up for that standard. If you don't want to reach up for it, then you can't be in my kingdom. The Jesus the Bible actually talks about says, I want you to count the cost before you become my disciple. I want your value system to be in place. So it's not going to do anybody any good if their value system hasn't been put in place to start with before you start the business of following Jesus. So look at, look at Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke 14, verse 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's pretty challenging, isn't it? That means you've got to first think, am I ready for Jesus to be first place in my life? So that everything else falls way down. And if that's not first place, then, you know, we might as well not even talk about other issues. Well, he's not, he's not through yet. Verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he says this, he says, now that's the standard. Now evaluate how you're going to get there. So verse 28 says, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Can I build this tower? Do I have what it's going to take to build the tower? Can I finish it? Can, or am I just got just enough to get started, but I can't finish this? Lest after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. And they said, this man, this man began to build. Look at that. And was not able to finish it. And people would, would say, that's a shame. Why didn't he think ahead of time? What's your priority system? What's your value system? And think ahead. Do I love Jesus? Do I know Jesus enough to love him? Do I know him as wonderful? Wonderful counselor. And I'd give anything to have wonderful counselor like that. And then nothing, nothing in my life is more important than that. And he used another illustration in verse 30. Or verse 31, he says, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Do we have the right position that we can, we can take on that amount of people? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right weapons? Do we have enough that with 10,000 can take on that 20,000? He says it'd be foolish for a king to just say, we're going to have a war. Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends delegation and asks conditions of peace. We don't need to get into a war. And so likewise, Jesus says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, Cannot be my disciple. That's the challenging Jesus. And that's much different than the Jesus you're hearing about today. He's going to, he's saying it's going to cost you. You got to evaluate. You know, if, if my parents don't stand for the truth of Jesus, I've got to, because I love Jesus more than them. 
or your child. We see this so many times. We see children go off and live together. That's fornication. Did you recognize that? That that's fornication. You just living with somebody. That's fornication. You're going to hell. You're dragging somebody else to hell. And when you look at the true picture, a lot of times parents will just, well, you know, they, they've got to sow their wild oats. And they don't tell them, hey, you need to straighten up. You need to do different than that. You need to, you need to understand that you're jeopardizing not only your soul, but that person's soul. You don't love that person if you're going to jeopardize their soul. Are you prepared to tell them the truth? Or are you just going to ignore it? You got to love Jesus enough to say, that's wrong. That's wrong. I don't approve of it and I'm not going to give my approval to it. It's going to cost you sometimes relationship with family. It may cost you hardships in life. Jesus said uh, that they will persecute you from one city. You flee and go to another one. Hardships. Second Timothy chapter three. All that would live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will suffer rejection. People won't like you. And then we get to thinking, you know what? Jesus was the most perfect man and he was wonderful. And they killed him. They hated him. They, they killed him. So what chance have I got? that everybody's going to like me if I'm following Jesus. No chance. Everybody's not going to like. There is no chance that if you stand with Jesus, that you're not going to suffer any rejection. You will. That's why Jesus says, count the cost right up front. It's going to cost you material things because, number one, the kingdom is first, and the kingdom is calling upon us to help in various ways, sometimes materially, like 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, say give and help out the brethren and give to those that are preaching the word and, and those kind of things. And so it's going to cost you materially, but you believe, I've already settled that in my heart, that the Lord is going to get my material things because he's already got my heart. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you study and prayer and assembly and good works. It's going to cost you your whole self, in fact. It'll cost you your whole self. Romans 12. Living sacrifice. A sacrifice that's continually living, but it's sacrificial. And it doesn't conform to the world. I don't want to be like the world. You see, that's the, that's the Jesus the Bible actually describes. He's calling for conviction. He's calling for you to be convicted that I'm good enough. Instead of like the rich man who says, good teacher, no, don't call me good unless you really believe I'm good. I want the conviction to be in your heart that I, that I have the best things with Jesus Christ. I call your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And you remember... Paul writing to the Corinthians about the nature of repentance. Do we hear enough about this? Because you remember Jesus says, Luke 13, 3, that you think people, the people that suffered that when the tower fell and it killed those people, you think they were that they were just more evil than you? He said, No, that's not the way it works. But unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. You may not perish the same way, but you're going to perish. Now, that message trickled down to the apostles, and they said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, 
And that trickled on down to the Apostle Paul. And he writes this to the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting with verse, let's start with verse 7. He says, not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was talking about Titus. Titus was comforted in you. And when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, what are they mourning about? Well, they're mourning because they got their minds corrupted and they got caught up in immorality and approving of immorality. Remember the man he had his father's wife in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? And they didn't mourn when they should have been mourning. And when Paul writes this letter, it really cuts them to the heart. And they're mourning now. And Titus can report, you know, that your letter worked. Your letter did the job. And you were worried, Paul, that they would they'd get mad at you because you told them the truth. And you were worried that they won't like you anymore. But what happened is your mourning turned into zeal for Paul. In other words, they started appreciating. He told us the truth. We can't blame him for that. In fact, we should appreciate him for that. And so there was a turnaround in their attitude toward Paul because he told the truth. And so he said, and so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, that first Corinthian letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it at the time, I just knew this is the end of my relationship with them because they're going to cut me off after this. How many preachers have thought that when you got up, got up to preach and Oh, the brethren are not going to appreciate this, but we need to hear this. We need to hear this. And how refreshing it is when somebody comes out and says, boy, I sure needed that. You stepped all over my toes. Well, I stepped on my toes first. I want to tell you that. I stepped on my own toes. But we all needed this. And he said, and the brother says, you are absolutely right. We needed this. So Paul, when he wrote that letter, he regretted it because in one, in one way of looking at it, he thought that they were really going to be mad at him. And now that he recognizes it did what I was really hoping, and it was it made them think, and it made them turn from their sin. He says, I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry. Though, though it's just for a while, I mean, when you turn around, you don't have to be sorry about turning around. And it made you sorry for a little while. But now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You were made sorry in a godly manner. That you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance. When you are sorry in a godly way. Instead of sorry he caught me. Or sorry he knew about it. Brethren we don't need to get that way. Because if you're that way your mind has already been corrupted. From the simplicity that is in Christ. You've, you're, you're already captivated by Satan. So you don't need to let yourself get to the point where you are sorry they found out. If that's what you're sorry about, instead of sorry that you got yourself entangled in sin. If that's what we're sorry about, is that we got caught. That's not a godly sorrow. And so, so Paul was happy that it was a godly sorrow that produces repentance to salvation. Not to be, re nobody regrets repenting. I don't re regret when I've repented. What I regret is I didn't repent sooner. Verse 
And that's something you never regret, but the sorrow of the world, I mean, that's just going to lead to eternal regret. For I observed this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, and notice when you sorrow in a godly manner, it starts shaping you, it starts changing you. Notice he says, what diligence it produced in you. In other words, you got on fire now, and you're wanting to do the right thing, and you've got the right motivation, and you love Jesus, and you think he's wonderful, and you think he's good enough, and what diligence it produces. Isn't it wonderful to see a brother or sister come to themselves and come home? What clearing of yourselves. I mean, you just, you just been over backwards to do the right thing. What indignation. That is, I just hate that I got so involved with that stuff. I mean, I hate it. Become indignant about your own foolishness. How, how did I let that happen to me? And what fear. Probably, I, I'm afraid that I'll, be around people that will influence me that way again. And I'm not going to let that. I'm afraid for that to happen again. What vehement desire. The desire to do the right thing. And what zeal. What a change in these people. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And therefore although I wrote to you. I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. And therefore, we've been comforted in your comfort. It's wonderful. When a church recognized this, we are about transformation, not con conforming to the world. And so Jesus, the real Jesus, calls for godly sorrow, genuine repentance. I mean, how could that not happen if you have your value system in the right place and you know why Jesus is good teacher? Genuine repentance is something that it can develop easily once you have that in place. The Jesus the Bible actually describes says most people can't see. Most people can't see or enter the kingdom of heaven. You remember Nicodemus came to him by and Nicodemus was one of the people that supposedly knew a lot about the law. Came to Jesus by night. He says, good teacher. We know that you're a man come from God, for no man could do these miracles unless God is with him. And Jesus says, unless you, unless you, a religious man, unless you are born again, you'll not see the kingdom. Well, they were expecting to see it with their physical eyes, but Jesus says, there's just some things pe some people can't see. Now, look over in Luke chapter 16, just a moment. Luke chapter 16. And look at verse 15. Luke 16, verse 15. He said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Do you see that? You can't go along with them. Then drop over to the 17th chapter in verse 20. 17th chapter of Luke, in verse 20 and 21. He says, now when he was asked by, his, by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here, here it comes. Now, I mean, you could do that with the Babylonians when their kingdom was coming and going to captivate us. You could see, so there, come, there it comes. Here comes the kingdom of Babylon, and we're going to get swept up in it. But the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation like that. So you can't point to it on the map. 
He says, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. When it's within you, it's shaping and it's formulating your concepts and your faith. Most people can't see it. But then go on into chapter 18, verse 17. And he says here, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. You won't get into it. Because you see, you've got to be challenged by the right Jesus. And there's only one that will challenge you to look deep within your heart. Only this Jesus is the one that has the real evidence presented for him. Yes, by disciples who may have originally been reluctant to write some of these things down because some of it was pretty surprising, but they wrote it down and they followed it and they believed it and they believed that it was worth every sacrifice that they would have to make. Only this Jesus is worth believing, and only this Jesus is worth serving. You know, when somebody can give you everlasting life, he must be mighty, mighty, impressive. And he must be somebody who can give us the very best that can be had. Both in this life. Remember Paul writing, godliness with contentment is great gain. Having promise of the life that now is. You get the best life now. And the best life to come. Eternal life. Believing in the real Jesus means, I believe that. That no matter the sacrifice that he calls for. He is more than worth it. He is more than worth it. Do you believe in that, Jesus? That's the question. Do you believe in that, Jesus? That's the real one. That's the right one. If you've never come to Christ and you know this is the right one and I want to serve him, and I'm going to put him ahead of everything else. Then give him your heart tonight and begin a new life with him. Unite together with him in baptism. Rise up with him to walk a new life together. And then live the rest of your life saying, you know, I, I didn't think I could handle this. And you couldn't on your own. But join to him and walking together with him. Oh, then his burden is easy. And it's light. I was thinking in terms of me having to bear all the burden. But this is a partnership now. And now I think in terms of walking through life. Can I walk through life with Jesus? And the answer is every time. Absolutely, you can. And if you want to begin that tonight, we can help you in any way. Come now as we stand together. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.